this special episode of Voice of the Sea, we're learning about Waima'oli, Hawaii's freshwater initiative to ensure water abundance for future generations. We talk to experts across Hawaii about water conservation, water recharge, and water reuse. We start off with Dana Okano from the Hawaii Community Foundation. Water is foundational to everything in life. Hawaii clearly values sustainability. We have been demanding it more of our leaders and we've been practicing it more as people of Hawaii ourselves. There is definitely a momentum building. I, I get contacted all the time. People are interested. They want to know more. When we look at things such as changing rainfall patterns, when we look at um, our increasing population, our record-breaking tourism numbers, all of these are drawing down the water availability that we currently have. Our water systems are quite old. They've been put in over many years and a lot of the upgrades and needs are very expensive. So it comes in balance with other priorities that we have and looking for places where you can um, have joint win-win goals or objectives. Next, I talked to Micah Kane and Tim Johns at the Hawaii Community Foundation to learn more about the Freshwater Initiative for the year 2030. Hawaii Community Foundation recognizes, much like the Hawaiians did many centuries ago, that water is wealth and water is wealth of a community and a community is only as strong as the wealth that it has. And, and water is such a critical element to assure that a community can thrive, whether it's the jobs it provides, the homes it provides, or the quality of life it can provide. Water is the most critical element for our long-term success as a place. We need to put ourselves in a position where we are determining our destiny. We asked the scientists to come in and tell us what do our aquifers have now? What do they produce now? And we did an estimate of what the demand might be going forward in terms of population growth and what the impacts might be from increased development and from climate change. And then we made this estimate of 100 additional. We need 100 million gallons per day by 2030 just to keep us where we are today in terms of having a sufficient groundwater supply that's sustainable for the long term. Having that kind of sustainable groundwater supply in place will make us much more resilient no matter what happens around the rest of the world, whether the sea level rises, et cetera. Next, I catch up with Reggie Castanares at the Plumbers and Fitters Training Center to learn about the role of plumbing in conserving fresh water. For the plumbing and mechanical industry, you know, we, we're like the protectors of water. In a residential or a commercial setting, it, it runs from 34% to 90% that is potable water used on non-potable water fixtures. Just stepping back and reflecting on, on the idea of, of using the most current uniform plumbing codes to create a dual system that you can save roughly 34 to 90% of your potable drinking water, you could save our future of water. Next, I'm talking with Barry Usagawa at the Honolulu Board of Water Supply about the need to conserve fresh water. As sea levels start rising, more and more of urban Honolulu will be inundated. How are we going to re fix the main break and restore water service? Right now, it takes us a day. Will it take us two, three days before people get their water back on? We need to do something now. And we cannot move Waikiki. We cannot move Kaka'ako. We have to adapt to that. By 2040, you're flooding 24 times a year. That's 22 years from now. We need to get going on it. And so we're trying to do our part. Next, I'm touring the Huiku Maoli Ola Gardens with Rick Barboza to learn how native plants can help conserve fresh water. Whenever you treat your landscape like you would a restoration, you are automatically turn it into a xeric garden or a xeriscape because you're matching the plants to that environment. The water requirements that would naturally occur there 
is what the plant needs. You don't need to do much more additional watering to the plants once they're established. Not only that, they help capture a lot of the water that otherwise would have been lost to runoff. These plants and this style of landscaping contribute to a sense of place. Whenever a plant goes extinct or an animal goes extinct, all of the cultural uses and applications that are associated with that plant or animal is also in jeopardy of being lost. The theory behind utilizing native plants is you put plants in the ground that, that evolved to live in that environment. You actually help to improve the overall native community of species within the area. A lot of our, our native insects and birds and anything that could potentially benefit from our native plants are restricted to areas that are inaccessible to a lot of people. Every house that we landscape, we are providing little stepping stones for these animals to, to utilize and, and spread their wings uh, to, to reach more area. We all play an important part in conserving fresh water. You can help by using smart landscaping practices, reducing leaks, and using efficient fixtures. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're in the watershed forests of Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii. We talk to hydrologists and ecological experts working to conserve and reestablish native plants and animals in these forests in an effort to not only preserve the aina, but also to recharge the underground aquifers that feed the Hawaiian islands with fresh water. We start off with Unalia Woodside from the Nature Conservancy in Waikamoi Preserve on Maui. We're standing here in the uplands of Maui on the slopes of Haleakala at Waikamoi. Waikamoi is the heart. It is the po'owai. It's the fountainhead of the watershed for Maui. We're standing here in a predominantly native plant, native understory, ferns and shrubs and canopy. And that makeup of native forests we've learned through research over the years is much more efficient, sometimes 50% more efficient at harnessing this fog and cloud moisture that we see. The science has helped us understand that the condition, the health of the forest, when it has abundant native resources, when it's diverse, when you see from little shrubs, little grasses and ferns to medium shrubs and mid-level understory and canopy, when you see all of these different levels, we've come to understand that's very important. So creating that place, setting it aside, and then removing those threats, those things that endanger the plants from thriving, in order to ensure that this big sponge that we have at the top of our islands continues to produce this fresh water that we, we need for ourselves as residents of the islands, our visitors get to enjoy. We, other places, things we don't think about. So many businesses rely on fresh water. Agriculture businesses, our streams and the stream life, all of that rely on us being able to effectively take care of these places, remove those things, things that aren't native or natural to the space, manage them, enables um, us to have a forest that will continue to produce water for us into the future. Next, Allison Cohen explains how the Waikamoi Preserve is actively managed to help keep out invasive species. The Waikamoi Preserve has been around since 1983. It was established with Haleakala Ranch. Um, it's a permanent conservation easement that we are granted. So in perpetuity, the Nature Conservancy will manage this landscape, about 9,000 acres. So we have zero animals in the preserve. We have to work really hard to maintain that. 
in some areas that are susceptible to storms will check those fences, you know, once a quarter. And there's over 60 species of ferns in Waikamoi. It's just incredible diversity. And so it's definitely a sought after research site. And so we have researchers apply to do research in the preserve. We've found out amazing things through that on spiders, bats, forest birds. We work really closely with the forest bird project here. The resources are really incredible. A place like Waikamoi Preserve, when you have the diverse forest structure and this canopy of ohia and koa and all these species, it's a system that's working. And we need to make sure that we support it and make sure that it continues to thrive. And it is our best chance for water and watersheds and water recharge for that continuing in light of, of climate change. If we give up, if we stop controlling the, the animals, if we stop controlling Himalayan ginger, all of a sudden things like Rapidohia death and the invasive species, they will increase. And that resiliency will make this forest not good at capturing water and recharging. And if we work hard enough, we can actually expand the native forest and expand the habitat for birds that are threatened by climate change, maybe allowing them to have a greater chance of succeeding in light of all these threats. So the resiliency of the forest and the upper watershed is really important. Next, we're in the Kona watershed on the west side of Hawaii with Kamehameha Schools hydrologist, Kaeo Duarte, talking about the path of water through the forest. You can think of a, a droplet of water that's hitting the ground and those that doesn't get taken up by the trees or evaporated out, you know, will go into the, the, the shallow soil layer or if there's a lot of rain flow over the surface and then it would go down gradient. You know, one rivulet will hit another rivulet, we hit another one. And before you know it, you have a stream. So you have recharge of stream by a forest. So here in Kona, due to the geology and the very porous rock, we tend not to have many streams, except in big rainfall events, you will see our streams flow. Mm -hmm. But in general, most of the water that is not either evaporated or taken up by our trees is going down into our deep groundwater aquifer, which heads to the ocean. As it heads to the ocean, you'll find a lens of fresh water floating on seawater as you get to the ocean. And then you see at the ocean sometimes, especially at low tide, you see fresh water bubbling up. And that's that fresh water that is started here all the way in the forest and made its way all the way down. Sometimes that, that drop of water fell 100 years ago and it may take 100 years or more before it makes it to the ocean. So sometimes you could be at the ocean drinking 100 year old rain. And then that will manifest in how our Hawaiians here had a lot of dug wells. So you still see some, a lot of them are lost unfortunately. You still see basically holes in the ground on the ocean that our Kona people would definitely take care of. Because remember, we had no, had no water bottles, we had no pumps and wells, so they would take care of these and they would have fresh water floating on salt water and you would skim that and you could drink that and use that. So you still find some of them in Kona, North and South Kona. In today's world, we're realizing how do we find balance in trying to have more mixed use agriculture mixed with forest silver pastoral type uses or more complex agriculture is really the way to go. At the same time, we want to maintain some of these environments, not just for hydrology or ecology, but for the cultural and spiritual elements of having these places. You can, you can hear our native birds and here just over there, you know, there's maile, there's palapalai, there's other things that are used for dance and for medicine and so forth. So having these landscapes existing today, I believe are important to the existence of Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian people. We're on Oahu at the Manoa Cliff Trail with Suzanne Case, the chair of the State of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources. This is the beginning of an exclosure area that a number of volunteers have been working on every Sunday morning for over 10 years, probably closer to 15 or 16 years. We're up on top of Tantalus, and that is in the middle of the Honolulu Watershed Forest Reserve. And so this whole area, all of this area is watershed for the city of Honolulu. This is where we get our water. Pigs have hugely expanded their population in the last 50 years and they dig everything up and 
eat in the middle of ferns and kill the ferns. And we're in a bit of a race against time here because if we don't control these invasive species, the forest will degrade. So what we're trying to do is keep it from getting worse. And then we're trying to get the part that's you know, still in pretty good shape. We're trying to improve it. As individuals, what can we do to help protect our forests? Pay attention to what you plant in your yard. There's a weed risk assessment you can, you can find online that will tell you whether what you're thinking of planting in your yard is something that might escape up into the mountains and create a problem. Australian tree fern was a classic example of that. Many people have now stopped planting Australian tree fern, but it's, it's an invasive species and it takes over, even in areas where our native tree fern, the hapu'u, will thrive. Scrub your boots, plant native plants when you can. Native forests will continue to provide fresh water for Hawaii as long as we protect and maintain them. Hawaii has committed to protect 30% of watershed forests by the year 2030. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're learning about the newest strategies for recycling wastewater. We'll check out farms that use recycled water and tour a new University of Hawaii building that captures and treats wastewater and rainwater. But first, we start off at Manele Bay Wastewater Treatment Facility on Lanai. Lanai has the capability of recycling 100% of its wastewater on island. We're the only major Hawaiian island that has that capability. We're really essentially farming bacteria. Certain bacteria like aerobic processes or want to have oxygen. And certain bacteria like anaerobic processes so they don't want to have oxygen. Okay, Joy, tell me a little bit about where we are now. So we're up in Lanai City itself. We were down in Manelli and we came up the mountain about eight miles and quite a bit in elevation. So down below, we were looking at all our happy bugs and our bugs doing all the work for us. Here, we're letting the plants do the work for us. We accept the wastewater from the county and it slowly filters through all these hyacinth plants. And so the hyacinth plants are using the nutrients in that water and growing. If you think back on it, uh, humans have been using plants to recycle for you know generations upon generations. This is our 10 million gallon R1 reservoir that is used to irrigate portions of the city. This is a natural resource. 350,000 gallons of water a day is being recycled. That means 350,000 gallons a day that we don't have to pump out of the ground that can stay in the aquifer, that can stay in, in the, the Lanai Hale. We don't have to do the pumping costs. We don't have to do the chemical costs and all that that involves. So this, it's an untapped resource. Next, we're at Kunia Farms on Oahu, checking out local produce being grown with recycled water. Today, we have over 5,000 acres here in Kunia growing produce and fruit that is shared with the Hawaii community using all recycled water. These kalo field that we're looking at here, this is all watered, irrigated with recycled water. Yes, and the nice thing is that They've actually incorporated the drip irrigation concepts that the sugar industry and pineapple industry developed 40, 50 years ago. And that technology transferred has moved over into diversified ag.
And what other types of crops are now being tested with this re recycled water? All your leafy vegetables, your Chinese cabbage, your purple cabbage, your tomatoes, bell peppers, uh, sweet corn, potatoes, onions, bananas, avocados, I mean, pretty much everything you can think of. Is there any crop that wouldn't take to this recycled water? Is there any reason you couldn't use it? No. Um, the Department of Health allows what we call R1 water, which is the best treated and recycled water to be used for all forms of irrigation. One of the challenges we have with a growing population and as we continue to pave over our, our lands, there's less land that's exposed to uh, take in the rainfall and recharge our aquifers. We see a much more runoff into the oceans. If we don't address some of these issues now, um, we're going to be in a lot of hurt by the time we really need it. I don't believe that we're going to be allowed to discharge into the ocean forever. That's a wasted resource. And there are so many opportunities, even here on Oahu, to use non-potable water for irrigation. When people are looking for a dollar return on investment for water reuse, you're not going to find it. But if you're looking at a return on investment because of the social issues, then yes, then we have an obligation to, to do that. Next, we're at the new UH West Oahu Admin and Allied Health Building checking out the design and technology that allows the recycling of water used inside the building, as well as the capture of rainwater from outside. How novel is the technology that's being used in this building? This is probably one of the first buildings to demonstrate kind of all three of these principles in one setting. Rain catchment is not a necessarily a novel technology. We see that in many of the rural areas across the islands. The gray water system is pretty new for Hawaii, but has been applied to multiple areas across the United States and beyond. And condensate recovery is one of those up and coming because it's really a very clean water resource that doesn't really require that much filtration and then that much cost to actually capture and then put back into the landscape. Future master plan communities really need to be thinking about these types of strategies because we're going to potentially have dwindling supplies of our potable water, but we'll have all this other abundance of water around us if we just get efficient and smart about its management. Next, we're at the Pacific Water Conference, where we catch up with water reuse expert Dr. Baum and Sheik. Groundwater reservoirs are our biggest water supply source. In Oahu, it's 90% of our water comes from groundwater, from wells. Statewide, 60%, so it's the majority. It's a good, good thing to replenish, because if we don't replenish it, we overdraft the groundwater, and then seawater comes in and really ruins the quality of the water. Right, which will happen more and more as we face rising sea levels. Exactly. Right now, water is priced so cheaply that it's viewed as uh, valueless. Whereas water is life. I mean, its value is infinite. Without water, we would be nothing. <laughs> we would perish. We have so much of it and so plentiful. Every time we open the tap, it's there that we take it for granted. Over the next 15, 20, 30 years, we're going to have a deficit. The state as a whole is going to experience a deficit of the order of magnitude of about 100 million gallons per day. This deficit is mostly because of population increase and its demand, but the other part of it has to do with uncertainties caused by climate change and the droughts and uh, natural events that could happen. If we can forestall that over the next 20 years, we will be there like we are now. Right now there is no deficit, but there will be a deficit if we don't do anything. So that's a major benefit to, to avoid uh, having a situation where we're out of water. Recycling and reusing fresh water will not only help protect our water supply for future generations, but also help to protect the environment by keeping fresh water in local streams and underground aquifers and preventing excess nutrients and pollutants from going into the ocean and onto our reefs. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea.